Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining this uh, panel on how to join the quantum workforce. My name is Florian Gall. I'm the manager of the Yale Quantum Institute, uh, and I'll be one of the moderator for this panel. So we are delighted to continue this series of talks and, and panel and uh, so that are organized jointly with the engineering workforce development of the Center for Quantum Network in Arizona. Uh, and the Yale Quantum Institute. This is the third panel in our series uh, on focusing to prepare today uh, on how to get uh, a job or like how to put all your chances on your side to get a job uh, in academia and to uh, have to become assistant professor or have any faculty position. So we wanted to, uh, to offer this uh, series of uh, professional development uh, panels because building quantum technology uh, really requires a lot of people from different backgrounds. Uh, we need physicists, electrical engineer, computer scientists, software engineer, chemists, and it can be a little bit overwhelming uh, to, to consider all the options and all the career you can have in the field of quantum science information. Um, so today we'll hear from uh, postdocs and recent faculty members uh, that, uh, that will talk about the experience on uh, what it's like to work in the field of quantum and get advice on navigating the various uh, pathways to do uh, an academic career. Um, so the, my colleague, uh, Russell Balliet, uh, who is the assistant director of the Center for Quantum Network, uh, will serve as a moderator and uh, I will let him introduce uh, himself uh, and talk a little bit more about uh, the, um, the center. Yep, so um, as Florian said, I'm Russell Ballier. I'm the um, Assistant Director for Engineering Workforce Development for the Center of Quantum Networks, um, who is a new center and just kind of getting started and we'll be laying the foundations for the quantum networks and the technologies as well as looking at the societal impacts and part of the reason we want to do this panel is to help develop the engineering workforce development and give you all a little bit of information uh, about how you can join the quantum workforce thank you and then you have on my uh, on my webcam some uh, some information about the center, uh, so you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel to have all the information about this center. Um, so uh, before we introduce uh, the uh, the rest of uh, the panelists, um, I want to uh, walk you through a little bit of um, housekeeping. So we are recording this event, and so it'll be uh, available in replay if you want. Uh, and then you can use the chat, the Q&A feature in Zoom. So at the bottom, you should have two speech bubble. You can just answer, uh, ask all your question, and then we'll try to go through um, all of them. So you can have uh, really um, like a, a better understanding on what it will take to uh, get one of these positions. Uh, okay, so let's start by uh, introducing our panelists. Um, so please, you can feel free to turn on your webcams and uh, we'll start with uh, Lin Ran Fan uh, from the University of Arizona. Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Lin Ran. Uh, so right now I'm an assistant professor at College of Optical Sciences at University of Arizona. So I graduated from Yale University in electrical engineering in 2017. So it's good to see some familiar names from YQI. So I spent six years on Hill House Avenue. Yeah, so right now uh, I'm part of the, uh, the CQN, the Center for Quantum Network Cent uh, Center. So right now my group is working on uh, quantum integrated photonics and especially related to quantum sensing and continuous variable quantum, uh, quantum information. And right now in my group, I have uh, two postdocs and uh, six graduate students. So yeah, so, and I actually joined the faculty of University of Arizona in 2018, yeah. So it, I just passed my three year major review actually. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you. Um, the the, the three-year mid review is always a little bit stressful, I guess. <laughs> Good luck with it's that. Not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shruti, Bari, uh, do you want to uh, go introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Shruti, um, and I'm a assistant in the applied physics department at Yale. Uh, I just started last year in July, um, so I'm still quite new. Um, 
And, you know, I work, I'm a theorist. I work in uh, quantum information theory. Um, I, I've always been interested in quantum mechanics. Like, you know, when I was um, in high school, I, I heard about the fact that, you know, particles can interfere like waves and so on. And so that, that just blew my mind. Um, so I knew I wanted to study quantum mechanics um, uh, further. And then when I came to grad school, um, I was intrigued by the fact that you could compute using the principles of quantum mechanics. Like you can imagine building an operating system uh, based on quantum mechanics. So that was just completely bizarre. And I just, just wanted to be a part of this uh, mysterious uh, field. And so, you know, that's how my journey started. Um, and now, uh, you know, I just started my group last year. I have two uh, graduate students, one postdoc, and two new graduate students are coming, uh, are joining us this fall. And uh, I also have an undergrad uh, working with the team. So that's my story. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, and then, so this is, uh, so Linran and Shruti can uh, tell us about their experience as a recent faculty member. And then we also wanted to include uh, uh, Anderson Brito, uh, who is the co-chair of the Yelp Postdoctoral Association. And so um, you can uh, introduce yourself, uh, please. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me here today. It's really a pleasure to be here sharing a little bit of my experience as, as a postdoc. Uh, I am not a, 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 a quantum scientist, let's say. I am a biologist with a master's in, in virology and a PhD in, in computational biology. So I have this very interdisciplinary uh, sort of back, uh, background. And as was just said by, 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 by sorry, by, by Florian, I am here basically re representing the Yale Postdoctoral as 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 Association as one of the co-chairs currently. And I got invited by Florian, which was one of, of our of, of, of our co-chairs co in the past and a founder member of this of this Yale Association. And it's really nice to be here today to share a little bit of my of my experience as a postdoc at EA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, do never uh, underestimate the power of networking uh, because even if we uh, if I haven't met you, I will reach out to you and <laughs> we can we can do great great things. Uh, so okay, let's uh, kickstart uh, this um, this meeting. Uh, and and we're gonna ask we're gonna answer some of the question and so the, I think the first one that comes in mind when we think about faculty member is uh, the, the stress as postdocs and as senior grad students of who how can I find a faculty position and like what are the steps and so can we uh, can we have either uh, Shruti or Lin Rand uh, go over the the, the the process of like what are all the steps that you took to uh, to get this position and you can you can. Uh, and so that from any angles that uh, you thought would be helpful. Maybe we can start by uh, Shruti. Okay. Uh, yeah, so for me, the process was, um, you know, you, you basically hear about, you, you have to keep an eye. Okay, so for me, I kind of was looking where I wanted to be. And so I kept an eye about on the hiring um, uh, market in, in, in those particular universities. And also like my colleagues knew that I was looking, so they would forward me, you know, any announcements uh, made about hiring at their university. So you basically, you can be proactive in looking for uh, open positions at places, or, you know, you can obviously take help from your colleagues about this. Um, and once you, you know, usually the process starts around September, October, you know, you kind of know where you wanna go by September and then, uh, the deadlines for applications are around October, December, uh, sometimes late December. So you basically prepare your application process, which is like your CV, you have to write a research statement. Uh, basically you wanna, in, in, in your research statement, you wanna convey um, the, the things that you wanna do in the next five years um, or so in your, in your research group. Uh, and then, you know, you have to write a teaching statement, sometimes you have to write diversity statements. Um, and then, you know, there's blank, you just have to wait after, after all the applications are sent in, you just have to wait and have faith that somebody's actually found those, your application and is reading it. And eventually you'll, um, 
you know, hear from places, they'll, uh, sometimes they, they call you to have like a phone interview, uh, which, which is usually like maybe 30 minutes, sometimes it's even shorter. And then uh, if you, you know, go through that, then they'll call for in-person uh, interviews. Um, so I, I had, in some cases, both phone interviews and in-person in interviews. Um, and then again, there's a blank. Uh, you, you wait for a long time to hear back. And sometimes you have to, you know, ping them and be like, hey, what's, where, where is the application process at? Um, so yeah, that, that was my overall uh, experience. Maybe I missed something, Alan, do you wanna add in? Um, yeah, so I think you probably cover all the aspects of the faculty search, uh, but my experience is a little bit different. I mean, at Florin and Anderson, uh, and also Shruti, you mentioned that networking is actually quite important. So the reason um, why I got this position is actually, uh, I was quite lucky that when I was a postdoc, so I was not prepared for a faculty position at that time. And uh, I was approached by some colleagues that I knew when I was a graduate student. And also I got some information from my uh, advisors. And so, okay, there's a faculty position, I think that can fit you well, and why don't you apply it? and then applied and that's how, how I got it. And the preparation is quite similar, right? So we need to prepare the CV, write the research statement and uh, the teaching statement, diversity statement and all kinds of stuff. And also normally we need to give like two talks. One is the research talk about your, uh, about your works. One is like a, a talk talk to present your uh, research ideas for your future group. So, um, and I think both of them are very important. And the research talk uh, presents your capability and uh, the top talk uh, give, uh, will show how you, uh, how you will lead the group as an uh, independent researcher. I think that's also very important. Especially nowadays, I believe most universities, when they post the faculty position, they kind of have a uh, idea what kind of background, what kind of person they are looking for. So if your uh, uh, so if uh, your future plan matches their uh, idea, I think that will be very helpful. Yeah. Um, how many uh, how many application? Can you give us a ratio of like how many application did you send? How many responses did you get? Because we, we always hear like oh, the, there's very there's more production of PhDs than uh, position available, which I think in quantum is we're in a weird bubble these days. Um, I calculated that last year there was 161 faculty position open uh, in the US uh, in quantum. Uh, so it's quite a lot uh, for the field. It's a very hot topic, uh, but like. Can you give us a ratio of, of how many uh, interview or like how many position uh, did you interview for and uh, and like how many offered you? Like you can also keep that confidential. Just give us like a, a bulk order if you don't want to like disclose any of the other things. So for uh, me, uh, sorry, no, go ahead. No, Shuzi, I think you can go ahead because my case is not common. <laughs> right, so for me, I actually uh, went through the job market twice. Uh, one was, uh, 2018, 2019 uh, round, and then the other one was 2019, 2020 round. So in the first round when I applied, um, there were much fewer uh, quantum jobs open. Um, I, I think there was, I can't remember exactly how many, but I, I think it was like around five-ish or more universities that I applied to, but none of them actually said quantum information in it. A lot of times they, you know, um, send out, you know, a, a more general call. Uh, so unless you have an inside idea about what they're exactly looking for, you know, you don't know. And I just wanted to get an experience. So I, you know, get out the bad interviews before. Uh, and so I was like, yeah, I'm going to apply and see how it goes. So that in that round, um, uh, you know, I, I got one interview and that I didn't get a job. Uh, fortunately, I didn't get a job so that it, I could get a job at Yale, uh, so I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, so in the second round, the second year, the 2019, 2020 year, it was like amazing year for quantum. As uh, Florian said, there were so many job openings uh, in our fields. Um, and again, I think I applied to about eight, nine universities or so. Uh, 
I think I pretty much got calls from everybody except maybe two places. Um, and so it was a very stressful time because, you know, these, these job interviews take two days and like at least two or three days. And then you're, you know, you're basically on from eight in the morning to eight in the night. Um, and yeah, so yeah, then I, then you, like I said, I didn't get called, I think from two places, maybe three, uh, I got in-person interviews. Um, and then I got offers from a few places, uh, again, very lucky because I know that during that time, many people's, um, offers were withdrawn uh, due to the pandemic. Fortunately, that did not happen for me. Um, and yeah, that's when I landed at Yale. Yeah, my experience is not, I mean, yeah, because I was approached by uh, some colleagues. So at, actually in 2018, I just applied here. The only place I applied is University of Arizona. And uh, so, and luckily I got this position. And uh, after interview, I found, okay, this is a good place. And uh, I like the environment and the research and it has all the capabilities that I need for my experiments. So I just decided to join. But from my uh, experience talking to other colleagues, so um, yeah, the ratio is not good. I mean, but it's not bad. So as I think probably on average, one third will be get a call. And normally, uh, so people, uh, university will invite like around three to eight people for, for on-site interview and they will have a waiting list. And uh, if you are in the top three, then I think you have a pretty high chance because I mean, normally like Shruti, you will get offers from several places and you can only accept one. So then for other places, if you decline that offer, the Second person on that list will uh, will be offered the position, right? So, so that's why uh, Shruti mentioned a lot of plenty times, right? So there will be a lot of waiting time during the faculty uh, uh, search. Yeah. Um, we have a question in the in the Q and A. Um, how long did it take for you to prepare your research and teaching statements? So in in preparing the for the interviews, uh, was any aspect of it particularly challenging? So, um, so actually it's not long, normally uh, just one page or two pages. So not long, I mean, but it's, uh, it takes a lot of time to prepare that two page research statement, I believe. And uh, yeah, I think the key is that you need to kind of make a connection to your previous background, but you need to find a new angle to distinguish yourself. I think that's probably the most challenging part for myself. I can, I was actually trying to open up my research statement to see how long it was, but I was not fast enough. I, for, I, it, for me, it was much longer. Um, so I, I think the question is not about the, the size of the research statement, it was more like- uh, How much time, but, but yeah, I mean, it depends on also how long you have to make it, right? But like I started uh, preparing my research statement like over the summer, because uh, there's a lot of thought that goes in there. Uh, you have to show them that, you are capable of conducting new research and support, you know, ex graduate students over the next five years. So you have to show them that, you know, you're capable of building this whole research program. You're not a postdoc anymore. You're not just going to work on this one little project. You're gonna like lead a huge group. Um, so it takes a lot of time and effort. And, you know, uh, the teaching statement, <laughs> I spend much less time compared to the research statement. It is less important than, well, it's not less important, it's equally important, but it's, you know, it's, it's usually only two pages. So it goes a bit faster than the, than the research statement. And then you, you know, you have to write it early on so that you have time to send it to your colleagues, your advisor to get feedback from them. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah. So basically I would say by September end, at least it should be ready. Um, and you should already be getting feedback from your colleagues. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, Imran, you were talking about the fact that uh, your case was a little bit special because you sort of got uh, picked up by like one of your colleagues. And so I would like to talk about the importance of networking and connection in, in this field. Uh, can you, uh, how did you build your, how did you start building your network? Um, and then was it like your direct colleague or was it like a more extended network of, of researcher and, and, and fellow colleague? 
uh, so it's more extended networks. So because um, yeah, quantum information, especially within the US, so it's uh, even though uh, it's fastly growing, but it's not a huge community. So I guess most people know each other in the field. And uh, in many cases, um, maybe your advisor will some collaborative uh, projects with some uh, professors in other universities. And if the other university has a faculty opening, they will reach out to your, to your advisor and also to some institutes like uh, YQI. So that's how I know this position, yeah. And so the reason I was asking about networking is because uh, we uh, in the US and, and I think in, in many university in the world, they're starting to build a postdoctoral association that helps with the networking. Uh, and I would like to, uh, to uh, have a little bit more information about postdoctoral association with uh, Anderson. Can you talk a little bit about YPA and your involvement with the association? And yeah, while you yeah. look, I'll, I'll pull up the, the website of, uh, of the YPA. Yeah, sure. So this is, this is a quite young association. It was founded around seven years ago. But since then, it's been growing quite a lot. And in my view, it's, it has been transforming the experience of, of, uh, of postdocs and also associate research scientists at Yale by, by exactly uh, favoring uh, 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 networking, community building, because these, these are one of the, 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 the main aims of the Yale Postdoctoral Association. In the YPA, we try always to create this sense of community engagement. And also we, we always try to allow a positive experience at the, at the university by, for example, organizing events that are focused on, on professional development, like like seminars and also and also and also workshops, but also social events, which due to the pandemic will actually stop for a while. But we we have still been doing that via the internet by using Zoom, for example. And as Florian mentioned, we should never underestimate the power of networking because we may meet someone from an unrelated field and that person may eventually be your connection to someone in, in your field by many other means because the person is of the same nationality of a researcher in your field. There are many ways for you to get connected uh, indirectly to someone in, uh, in your field by just meeting people that are from other fields that are let's say in the same uh, level of your career. So I guess most of the, the people here, they, 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 are, they are postdocs uh, wanting to transition uh, into a, 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 let's say academic career. And by being a member of an association, there are many benefits. I have just mentioned the benefits related to networking, which is one of those, let's say, trans transferable soft skills that we learn via extracurricular activities, because it's quite common to see people focusing a lot on research skills, and they sometimes forget to, is to is strengthen a little bit of other is skills that they can also develop, like communication skills, networking, leadership, time management, project manage, management, all of these soft skills, they are extremely uh, necessary for a successful, uh, a successful career. And by being a member of, of, by being a member of an association, you may gain some of, of, of these is, is skills by taking part of trainings that such association may offer, but if you also join as an officer of that association, you would also have opportunities to strengthen such skills by organizing events, events yourself by basically being the leader of a group that has a project within the, the association that has to be finished within a defined time. So all of these sort of non-research activities 
they somehow teach us is, is skills that are extremely helpful as well in our academic career. Thank you very much. And, and while you talk, I have the, the website of the YPA and uh, on my screen. Uh, so it's uh, ypa.tl.edu. And uh, the, the people in the University of Arizona also have their own website. It's a similar association. It's uh, uapostdocs.webly.com. So you can, you can go and check what you, uh, uh, if you can make new connection. And um, I really agree that all the, all the work that you will do if you're engaged in the leadership of this association is really, really helpful uh, because you will start building connection. And also you will talk to uh, leadership and it's easy to talk to people on your uh, on your level, uh, on your peers, uh, but it's also a different thing uh, to start having to ask things to uh, university leadership. And I think it's a good training also for the job talks because that's that's what you're going to do. You're going to try to convince uh, above your uh, ab above your grade, and so that's I think it's a it's a pretty important thing. And um, all the skills that you develop, um, maybe we can go back to uh, Shruti and Inrans talking about like what kind of um, other skills do you need to have to build a research group? Because I think the more you, goes in, the more you go into um, faculty your job, your job is not to do the research as much as you do, but like more managing students and uh, writing grants. And you have a ton of uh, serving at, on panels at the universities uh, and other activities. Can you talk a little bit more about this, uh, these extra activities that um, grad students or postdoc are not necessarily aware of? wants to start yeah I, yeah i can get started so uh yeah you are right so it's very different to be a phd student or even postdoc uh with uh, be, being a faculty member so when i was a phd student or postdoc we just need to focus on one or two projects you just need to think about how to do your experiment better and how to uh yeah so how to finish the experiment but as a Faculty member, I think the biggest change is that uh, we don't really have a lot of time digging into the details of all the projects. But on the other hand, we still need to provide a, a big picture, guide the students, especially when we start a new group. So you are the most knowledgeable people in the group. But on the other hand, you have the least the time to uh, dig into the details of the experiment. I think that's the biggest challenge I've, uh, I've faced. So, um, yeah, so I think uh, it's good. Uh, it's better to balance the time you work on proposals. And also I still reserve uh, quite a amount of time doing experiments with the student, at least for the first several years. So therefore we can accelerate the process. But I think from, uh, it might be different from uh, for a theoretical group. So I think Shruti can um, say more about that. But for experiments groups, I think that I treat myself as a half postdoc, at least for the first year. So I still do a lot of like uh, uh, experiments. Uh, I went into I went into the clean room with the students together, just uh, help them do the fabrication, do all the experiments. But after uh, three years, when the first student or two students are well trained and they are good enough, then I can spend more time on other stuff. Yeah, you know, my sentiment is the same thing. I, I, I always say that having a research group is like having a startup. And so basically whatever skills you need to have a startup is what you need. You need to be able to write grants uh, and bring in money. You have to support your students. You do get a startup package, but you know, that's not gonna last you forever. Um, and so the advice I was given was like, you know, save that money as much as possible and just, you know, start writing grants uh, from day one, which is, which is what I did. Um, it's not only that you, as, as Linran also said, you have, you know, you, you're not going to, you have to, you know, prepare for your classes. You have to prepare your new courses that you're going to teach. You're going to write, write grants. So you don't yourself have a lot of time for research. Um, so fortunately in my case, um, uh, right in the beginning, I had a student uh, to join my group and she was, you know, pretty much at a good place. Uh, but I started like a quite different project, with different set of skill sets for her, but she caught on really fast. And so you need to be able to identify, you know, fast learners, I guess, and uh, take them on and write, 
like right now she is so good that I don't, basically she's training the new students coming in. Uh, so, so she is re uh, really, you know, the, I would say I, I could not have, I could not take more students on without her. I would not have the time to deal with everybody at that level. Uh, the other thing is, you know, again, like, you know, hiring postdocs and stuff, you need to be able to judge them. Like, you know, when they come give, you know, when you're interviewing them and they come give talks to you, you need to be able to write, ask the right questions and judge their capability. Again, hiring the right people is going to change your life. Like I hired a postdoc who's good. I don't have to, you know, like just tell him like, okay, we're we are thinking about this, you know, go figure it out and he figures it out. So, um, right. So after, after a while you needed to be a self-sustaining self thing, you cannot be, you know, person who's actually writing codes or, you know, figuring out the math and stuff. So these are the skill sets that you don't necessarily have as a postdoc, uh, but, you know, you, you, you need to develop. Is there any is there any place that like how did you learn this skill like is it on the job like first day you you know, they just push you in the deep end and like okay <laughs> you used to be a postdoc now you need to interview you need to write grants and all these things is there any resources somewhere that helped you I mean I would say that ask especially for grants I mean like judging somebody somebody's capabilities like how do you teach that right um, you just like you know. For me, it's like observe when people are giving talks um, and, and hear what, you know, your advisors are saying about those speakers. So, you know, like just, just you know, catch on to things that they're saying. So that's how you learn. Also ask, uh, in my case, as a postdoc, I did not get a lot of chance to be involved in grants. Uh, I, I got, got a chance to be involved in one grant, but not, you know, mostly for the scientific part, not so much the writing. But I would suggest that if, if there's one thing I could go back and redo again would be ask my advisors, can I be a part of this grant? So I, I learned the procedure and I, you know, get um, some like training of how to how, how these things work, how, how you should present your work and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, speaking of, of grants, uh, I know a lot of uh, university are giving uh, classes and resources and there's grant writing. Uh, are you familiar with this, uh, Anderson? Do you want to talk about uh, grant writing that can be offered by the, uh, the postdoctoral affairs? Yeah, so one thing that we have been, uh, uh, let's say, working a lot to make sure that we can offer to our members is exactly professional development uh, events, especially workshops. We have been organizing, uh, we have been organizing workshops about grant, uh, about grant, sorry, grant writing, article writing, like sci uh, scientific writing, let's say. And these are resources that we can get out of Yale because Yale has many offices that organizes uh, different different sorts of of workshops. They have they are experts on those specific topics, and they can teach us. But we have to somehow connect with them and make such requests. And this is something that we are quite happy to to see that we that the YPA has been these very important, let's say, intermediates facilitating that such a training can, can, can uh, let's say, be offered to, to, our, to, our, to, to, to our members because definitely having a method for writing grants and, and papers, this makes a, a, a huge difference. If you know how to structure things first before writing that, that can speed up the, the process and the final piece would look much more, much more cohesive, for example. And yeah, these sort of trainings we, uh, we can get out of, uh, let's say being member of, of a local association of, of, of postdocs. And if such association does not exist in your location, you could even create your own and start things from, from scratch. And this is this is what happened to me uh, when uh, so I uh, did my PhD in France, moved to Yale as a postdoc, 
And then there was nobody to help. And so a bunch of uh, postdocs that we met, uh, mostly European because of the, the logical, uh, the geographical connection, we, we had this mini network of, of foreigners that uh, uh, met at the office, the visa office at Yale, uh, got together and starting to say like, hey, how can we help each other? Because I think that's also the, the trick on everything. Like you should network, you should help everybody. But I think if you find interest, like if it's useful to you, it's going to be useful to others. And so it's something that you can do. And we're talking about Yale and U of A uh, a lot because this is our, our affiliations, but this is uh, valid for all the university in, uh, in, in the US and also um, in most of the world. I think uh, the university are starting to see that people need resources similar to that to prep, to prep them for the job market. So they, they are offering workshop. And, and now with the... Uh, with the pandemic, I think everybody shifted to a, a virtual world. And I'm pretty sure even if your university doesn't uh, offer this kind of thing, you can find virtual workshops uh, that you can attend or like view recordings online, like similar to one of these things. So it's really something that you should try to think about because in an ideal world, you are really good at what you're doing in your research, but the, the key where you're going to be judged for the applications and for these things is going to be everything else. Can you be the extra, uh, like, the, the are you the superstar in the field? And I think that's what people are, are looking in, in universities. Um, and so, yeah, that was one thing. And also one thing that I want to add, uh, we're talking about like how to get a job, but there's also an interesting thing, and I'm sorry, I'm going to bring the, the, the mood a little bit down, but not everybody's cut up to be a faculty member. Uh, and I think it's very important to, to realize, like, do I want to do that because it's the, it's the path that you want to do? Uh, or is it because your advisor told you like, hey, this is what you do. You do a PhD, you do a postdoc, and then you do a faculty. And so there's also something you need to, to think about is that, is that the kind of job that I want? Uh, and is it matching my skills and what I want to do? And there's a ton of new, uh, ton of different jobs in quantum. Uh, we're gonna cover in the fall, uh, the, the startup world and the industry world. So there's gonna be, I think there's also more and more option for uh, a job in, in the quantum workforce. And so if, if you're scared about writing grants or if you're scared about other things that there's all the, there's different possibilities. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll work on these things. Uh, we have another question in the chat, um, mostly for uh, Shruti, because you went to uh, two different rounds of application. Um, they wanted to know if, uh, is it better to wait a turn, like if you apply and then get a position that you could do better next time? Is it, is it worth taking it or would it, would it look bad, uh, similar to like burning bridges, if you decide to refuse the, this and then try to, try to get a better option uh, next year? What's your, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think as, as long as, I don't know, you don't hit somebody over there, you're not gonna like burn any bridges. They, they're not, um, like when you, when you, if you're called for an interview and you're not the first choice or, you know, not one of the top three choices, it doesn't mean that you are bad or you, you, you know, you don't have the skills. It's just that you, you're not right now fit for the particular direction that the university is looking at. Uh, it, it, so to me, uh, it's, it doesn't show anything negative. Um, that being said, I would say strike when the iron is hot. Um, you know, there are some key papers that you're going to publish uh, in, your, in your career. Uh, when those hot papers come out, apply for a position. You need to be out there and, and that's when you're going to be more popular. Don't wait for like, you know, two more years because after two more years, you may not have that another hot paper again, and then you know your chances are going to be uh, lower. Um, you're talking about hot paper, and like, how do you uh, can can you both talk about how can you strengthen your application? Uh, do you need to have teaching experience? Do you need to have grants? Like, what are the what are the things you can do as a senior grad student or as a postdoc to like have a really strong case for uh, the university to hire you? Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, of course, first of all, we need to have a, a good research background. So that's the foundation for everything, I believe. And on top of that, I think that if you have some experience uh, getting some grants as a PhD student or postdocs, I think that will add points to it. But I believe uh, in terms of uh, 
in the community of quantum information, I think there are not many chances for postdocs to write grants, I believe, because I know that for biology and uh, medical schools, postdocs can uh, apply for grants, but that's not very common in quantum information area. Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, uh, if you can uh, at least write something or uh, participate in some grant uh, preparation, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, uh, for, like I, I did not have any grants and I've never applied for a grant. Uh, I, I didn't get any awards or anything like that when you know I was a grad student or early in my postdoc career. Um, but you know what really you have to basically show that you know a the research you're doing is important. It's changing the direction of something, whatever field you are in. Uh, and you can, not only that, you can pump out, pump out that new research for the next however many years. Um, and you also have to establish your independence from your advisor. That, that was the one uh, important advice that I was given. Um, so it's, it's, you know, as a postdoc, uh, there's not a lot, again, it depends upon your situation. You may have an opportunity to do it, you may not. Experimentalist, it's a little bit hard because, you know, it's, it's the lab that your advisor has. So you basically do what's in the lab pretty much. For theorists, it's a little bit uh, easier. You can come up, you know, all you need is a paper and pen, so you can do whatever the heck you want to. So in my case, it was, you know, uh, I was able to demonstrate that my research is, is different and different from my advisor and that I'll be able to continue that research uh, into the future. Um, so that's uh, that's I would say is important. And I and I would also say that maybe applying for a fellowship to be a to be a po to be a postdoctoral fellow, it's a process that would somehow also teach us how to write a grant because it's a short version of a grant that you have to think about how that project will be developed, what are the what are the, the school objectives then you go through a process of selection. So this whole experience somehow it starts to teach us how to write a grant. And if, if we get that, that is something that is quite valuable. It's, it, it's seen as a sign of independence that you are able to search for a, a grant and eventually uh, get, get, get approval. So I would definitely advise like trying to apply for a fellowship. It's something that would definitely advance your, your abilities and will give you much better chances to get hired. Uh, just one more thing that I forgot to say earlier was also um, try to get as many talk, give as many talks as possible, uh, including try to get invited talks. Uh, they do look at that. They, they want to know that your research is important, that people will actually, you know, request for you to come and talk about your work and rather than you just, you know, applying to talk somewhere. Um, and regarding fellowship, um, there's more and more big centers, institute and industry providing a postdoctoral fellowship. I know YQI has the, the YQI fellowships um, that actually are open right now. So you can apply a year until November 15, just putting it out there if you're interested. Uh, but there's also a um, ton of similar programs everywhere. Um, so these are like, we call them like gold star postdocs. It's similar to your regular postdoc, but they have a little bit of shine on it. So that might help you like, so I'm gonna do everything, but it might like shine a little bit of varnish in your application, but that's also something you can do that might help a little bit. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so looking at the last few questions that I have um, regarding uh, inviting uh, talks, like how do you proceed for that? Like, is it similar to, we have a question in the chat about visiting scholars and visiting researchers during PhD and during postdocs. Is that something that um, you've done in the past or is it something that uh, we haven't seen, uh, you haven't done in the... In the uh, I personally haven't done any like visiting uh, scholars or researchers and any places. So the reason is because I'm an experimentalist. So 
uh, is basically I need to focus on one experiment uh, project and uh, we have already built up the capability in my own group. So there's no point for me to visit another group. And, uh, but I do see a lot of theorists visiting other institutes, especially uh, in many cases, I find it fruitful to have a theoretical researcher to, visiting, uh, to visit an uh, experimental group. And uh, I, in many cases, I find that discussion is very helpful. Thank you. Um, and then one, I think one last thing that I want to talk about uh, that was uh, pointed by Shruti, uh, I'm going to put the slide up. Um, there's the CMAMO um, rumor mail websites uh, that has a ton of uh, information about all the job posting. Um, do, did uh, any of you used it for your applications or like we're looking at the, the different openings or is it something that's uh, just a good thing to see the, the short list? It's actually my first time to, to know this website. <laughs> really? Well, for me, like I was told that this is where you basically live for the, uh, you know, during the application process. But no, like I, I did visit this website quite frequently to look for, um, you know, new positions that are open and which I might not have heard about before. Right. So actually, uh, when I uh, look for positions, I do realize that there's no centralized website or a good place that can have all the posted positions. So actually, Florian, I'm a little bit curious that you mentioned that you said there's 161 positions last year. I'm wondering how do you get that number? <laughs> Uh, so I went through uh, through the actually this website. They have a list of everything, and they uh, so this one the new posting for twenty twenty one have only two job posting right now. But if you go in the archive, you have all the list. It, it's, it's an endless list of scroll through. Uh, it it doesn't mean that there was one hundred and sixty position. Uh, it just mean it just meant that there was like some openings and. and I don't know if the university actually went through because of the, the pandemic and the job shortage, uh, or like the, the freezing of the of the um, of the fundings. But uh, yeah, that's something that um, this is where I found all the information. And then it was also uh, cross uh, cross posting, like cross loop cross referencing with uh, all the job posting that we that have received because we have uh, we have an excellent announcement section on our website. And so this is, I, I often get uh, a ton of, uh, of job posting from the other uh, centers. Also, that's something like if you, if you look for, uh, for jobs, that's something that you can do uh, looking at uh, the, the, your, your university listing or your department, they might have a section, uh, usually your, the chair of the department or your PIs received a ton, a ton of uh, open position. Uh, you might be able to, uh, to ask them to like, hey, if you see anything, just forward the email because they usually don't have time to read it. Uh, but they, if they know that you're looking, like if you, if you tell them, hey, I'm considering, I think communication with your advisor is really key. And like talk, I've seen people in conferences posting at the end of their talk, uh, hey, I'm looking for position, I'm looking for jobs. Like it's really important to like communicate what you want to do. Um, online presence is more and more important. Uh, so if you have a website, if you have a Twitter, like. The quantum Twitter is a very, uh, very active. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit sad to have everybody on social media working on like, keep working uh, outside of your work on social media, but uh, it has been a uh, pretty good resources to find a uh, job application for that. If I can also add something on this topic of job posting, and this has something to do with what, for, what, what, what Florian has just mentioned, uh, Twitter. It's a great resource of information about job postings. All the time, I saw like uh, advertisements about job postings on my area. I'm not in the right moment to apply for for them yet, but if I if I if I wanted so, just last week I saw one amazing job posting that was just passing through my my my. My my timeline, and and also Twitter is basically great for networking as well. I found my postdoctoral position through Twitter in a very in in a process of ser serendipity by just clicking clicking, and then suddenly I found this this job posting. One thing that I always recommend 
uh, join Twitter and try to use that professionally by having your bio describing who you are, where you went in, in, in terms of your background and you start following people in your field because eventually you may see on their profile a job posting that you would never find it by Googling or by looking at, at mailing lists because on Twitter you may by chance uh, find such information that, that are quite useful and such information comes from networking in this online environment. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that comment and insight. Uh, we're almost out of time. So what I propose is uh, we can go around and have like maybe a, a, the last advice of the of the hour. Uh, and then I'll, I'll uh, we can do around and then I'll show you the uh, the upcoming events in this series. OK, so like 30 seconds of wisdom from uh, all of you, like what's the what's the, the the best thing you can do or like maybe just best wishes, I guess. <laughs> Who wants to start? Uh, Shuri, you want to go? Oh, Lord, I didn't think about this before. Um, no, just I don't have much advice, but I, I just want to say that, um, you know, when I was a postdoc, I was very unsure about, you know, uh, being an assistant, you know, being a professor, like I knew I wanted to be that, but uh, I wasn't very confident or I wasn't sure whether I was going to get, you know, the position I wanted or not. I would just say, don't be afraid, you know, put yourself out there. Uh, if you're not going to take risks, you're not going to get any reward. So just just try it. If that's something that you want to do, uh, don't worry about whether you think you're good or bad or whatever. Just give it a shot. Um, Lane Ryan, do you want to do uh, last few words for me? Um, yeah, I think uh, as Ruti mentioned that there are a lot of uncertainties uh, when finding a, a faculty position. Uh, my uh, advice is that, well, uh, uh, so we should still keep focus on your research while you are searching for a position. So of course, uh, in the good situation, you find a position and you are ready to move to start your new group, but in a bad case, so you should continue your work and prepare for the next round. So my suggestion is that keep going, uh, continue with your current research work and focus on that while you are applying for a fab situation. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much all uh, for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Before we wrap up the, 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 this event, I would like to point out a few uh, events that might be helpful. The C2QA, which is the Co-Design Center for Quantum Advantage, which is one of the national uh, hubs that the government's put in place in the US. Uh, this one is the one that TL is part of, uh, out of Brookhaven National Labs in Long Island. Uh, is hosting a quantum uh, career fair uh, on uh, September 22nd. Uh, so if you're interested, go on their website uh, and check it out. And then um, the next event for us, so we talked about a ton of uh, different uh, way to get involved in uh, in the quantum field as uh, either studying it in college, uh, doing a PhD in grad school. Uh, we've talked about how to uh, put all uh, the chances behind you to become a faculty member. We're going to have two more events in this series, one in October to prepare for startup. The event will be on October 27 uh, at the same time on Friday at 4 p.m. And then we'll have one later on on industry jobs. So if you look, uh, we should have in the span of the full year covered uh, all of the possibilities uh, that you can do. And all the, the videos of these events are available uh, on YouTube on our website. So if you go on quantuminstitute.tl.edu slash videos, you should be able to see all of these, uh, all of these events. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your time and insight, and uh, I hope you uh, have a uh, really uh, prosperity in your research groups. And uh, Anderson, thank you so much for uh, joining us and giving us all this insight about the YPA. Thank you all for attending okay. and uh, have a good night. Thank you, thank thank you, you Florian. Much.